office and is currently working on a number of the Latin American Chapter 11 proceedings. And just uh, one housekeeping point before we begin, if any of the attendees have any questions for our panelists, we ask that you please use the Q&A section of Zoom to type out your questions and our panelists will do their best to answer your questions during the Q&A portion uh, at the end of their presentation. And I will now turn the discussion over to John who will begin uh, by telling you about airport slots and their importance. Thanks, Adam. Uh, so let me just jump right into it. I know we've, we've only got an hour. Uh, the very first thing I'd like to talk about in the area of airport slots is, is what exactly is an airport slot. Uh, I think some of you may have been sitting on the runway before and heard the pilot come on and say, look, we can't take off just yet because we're waiting on our slot. Uh, that's not what we're talking about. So that, that would be an ATC slot. Uh, an airport slot is a planning tool that the airports uh, and airlines use in advance of the day of operations to sort of uh, set the table, set the schedule uh, for the airport operations. So one thing that we often use as an analogy is, is that of a, a popular new restaurant that uh, has opened up. So if, if you've got more demand for this restaurant than you have space, then of course you'll ask for your customers to, to reserve a spot in advance. Uh, they'll call in and say, look, I'm planning to come to the restaurant at, let's say eight o'clock. Um, that sort of advanced planning tool is the analogy to an airport slot. Uh, an ATC slot then by contrast is what you deal with on the day of. Uh, so in the restaurant analogy, that would be uh, the Mater D trying to seat people as they come and they inevitably end up you know, showing up 15 minutes late or staying uh, longer than they expected, et cetera. Uh, so just want to be clear about what it is that we're discussing today. Uh, from a sort of global regulatory standpoint, one of the, the tasks that IATA has uh, is working with the airports, the airlines, and the coordinators in creating what we call the Worldwide Airport Slot Guidelines, or WASG. Uh, this is a sort of best practice uh, document that is the serve as the rules of the road for the allocation and use of slots. Uh, this document has been adopted by, I think, about 90%, uh, maybe even higher than that, of the slot-constrained airports worldwide. So it really is a, a good starting point if you're starting to, to try to get smart about airport slots and see how, they, how they're used. Uh, obviously, a critical issue for slots right now is the, the waiver for the COVID crisis. Uh, so one of the things that the industry is doing is uh, going out and, and speaking to the regulators and saying, look, um, the, the rules as they were in place don't quite work with COVID and with the border closures and the inability to fly flights uh, from point A to point B. Uh, so we're doing a lot of work on that to try to get the waivers in place for the upcoming winter season. Uh, but obviously, even you know, COVID aside, um, and it, when things were back to, or things were normal, uh, airport slots are a critical piece of operation for, for the airlines. You can't, uh, you can't get in and out of an airport without them, which means you can't operate uh, without them. So I think maybe if I can turn it over to Christian, he might sp speak a little bit more about uh, the, how, how you use a slot, how you operate it, and, and what you might do with that. Sure. Thanks, John. Um, so I think, as John just pointed out, this is one of the most crucial assets. So of course, if an airline goes goes into bankruptcy or insolvency proceedings. Um, it's one of the things creditors um, will be looking at, but also the estate will be looking at when it comes to continuing operations. And um, there are a couple of things to, to, to keep in mind. The most crucial is, as John just pointed it with the restaurant, how do you keep your reservation for the next week once you've had it? And there is something which is called the 80-20 rule or use it or lose it. So if you use a slot for 80% or more of the time in a year or in the period you've had it, uh, you are entitled to a grandfathering right, it means you can keep it for the next year. Um, that's of course something which is tremendously difficult in operating an insolvent airline because um, you need to clearly focus on, on what you are flying even if you can't have the responsible load factor uh, on the respective flight. So it means, that in order to maintain slots, you need to serve certain um, uh, certain uh, connections which which are not profitable. So at the same time, slots are uh, kind of the most the most valuable uh, in brackets asset. They are of course a right, so they are not an asset which you can sell. But this is clearly what the operational piece is all about. So COVID, as, as John just, just pointed out, of course, makes it very difficult for the airlines to 
keep that. And um, there is a kind of a, f a freeze, as I would call it, at least in Europe, going on currently until October 24th, where everything should just stay as it is. But the obvious question is obviously what's going to happen in the next year. Um, so, so in the next half year dur during the winter period, how, how long is that going to take? Is it going to be extended? So, so a couple of things uh, to watch out for when it comes to insolvencies and when it comes to maintaining them. Um, although a slot is a right um, and not an asset you can, you can sell, um, obviously, especially estates, but also creditors, but also airlines are trying to make use of them because they clearly have, an, have a value. So if you've got something, you might in theory think, okay, I can sell it to a competitor, which you can't do in most jurisdictions. In most jurisdictions, you will need to return them if you don't use them or if you're not operating anymore. Obviously, there are a couple of ways around when it comes to financing, when it comes uh, to selling uh, pieces of an insolvent airline. Um, you might have heard about a couple of things going on in, in the UK. For example, British Airways uh, used them as security for a bond uh, as early as 2012. Norwegian did something um, similar with their Gatwick slots last, last year in 2019. So um, there are technical ways of trying to get around it, which an administrator will try to make use of, which an airline when operating even outside an insolvency might try to use, which is putting them, for example, into a subsidiary where there are certain exemptions. You can do that as long as the subsidiary is operating as well and then trying to sell the shares in the whole thing. Um, but there is a concept um, which, which uh, at least from a US perspective, I think might be very interesting to look at. Um, I think, John, that's, that's something for you. Uh, I've, I've heard about a lease concept in, in the US so, so that, you, that you could use them by leasing them off. Uh, yeah, so it, it's in, very important to look at um, what your particular jurisdiction allows. And, and it's not just the jurisdiction where your airline sits, but it's the jurisdiction that you're holding slots in. Uh, so a, a U.S. airline may have slots in the U.S. and Europe and Brazil, wherever. Uh, and you'll have to look at the local legislation for each airport. And it is, um, well, as Christian says, in most jurisdictions, you can't sell slots, although there are some exceptions. Uh, there are abilities in some places, like in the U.S., to lease slots. Um, so you've got to you've got to really dig into the regulations in your local area uh, to make sure you you know what all the options are, uh, and really, when you're looking at planning an insolvency, uh, making sure that you think about your slots before you pull the trigger, uh, because there are a lot of um, dominoes that can fall very quickly when you do that uh, that may end up at the end of the day with you losing your slots, which if you're trying to reorganize is a killer, obviously. Uh, so I don't know, Christian, if you want to speak more about that, or I'm, I'm certainly happy to talk as well about the need to talk to, uh, to coordinators before you file. No, I think I would, I would pass it on for the need to, to talk yep. to coordinators because that's, that's clearly uh, the, nec the next big thing you need to do when you prepare a filing. Because if <laughs> yeah. You <get> wrong. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, so, so I guess that is one, one sort of plea uh, to the airline practitioners out there, whether you're at an airline or, or at a law firm or other uh, external advisor, do speak to the coordinators uh, about what your plan is. If you know that you're going to be filing an insolvency or uh, even on day one of filing the insolvency, uh, the coordinators are placed in uh, sort of a challenging position. The slots are obviously a scarce resource, at least at some airports. Uh, and, and there's this tension between trying to balance the legal rights of the bankrupt airline and the interest of creditors in maximizing uh, and monetizing the value of the slots versus a need to reallocate the slots to other airlines so that the uh, the operations of the airport can continue on so that they can use you know best use capacity and not have a bunch of empty uh, space sitting there not being operated uh, so the wsg provides for this uh, um, a lot of local rules and regulations will as well uh, but please do have that conversation with the coordinator as soon as possible so that they can start uh, planning things with you thanks john i'm um, very interested interested in knowing how this balance has been struck in previous cases, uh, starting with the allocation for the benefit of creditors. Kat, can you give us an, an overview of a case where this has happened? Right, so I think the first case that comes to mind is, is Monarch. And um, Monarch was a case where operations had ceased. 
the airline was no longer flying, uh, staff were dismissed, and the operating license had been suspended. Now, Monarch did appeal the license suspension, but at the time of the allocation, Monarch didn't really have the ability to use the slots. Uh, but have you, uh, as you've all heard, these slots are very valuable. And so um, the coordinators of some of the UK airports refused to allocate slots on the grounds that the airline was no longer an airline for slot regulation purposes. Um, the trial court agreed with the coordinators, but the appellate court then overruled. And so um, Monarch was able to, to monetize these, these slots. Um, so I think that's, that's a case where slots were monetized for the, for the benefit of creditors. Thanks, Kat. Uh, after Monarch, there was another case in Brazil in which uh, the courts and regulators had to struggle uh, with the balance between maximizing the estate and re reallocating slots in the interest of competition and efficient use of capacity. John, could you tell us about a case uh, where this happened? Yeah, uh, so with Avianca Brazil, um, somewhat similar circumstances to Monarch uh, in that there was a, a bankrupt airline, Avianca Brazil, who had some, uh, not necessarily financially valuable, but certainly valuable from a competition standpoint, uh, slots, uh, especially at Congonhos Airport, uh, where there, there's a high, high level of congestion. Um, so the, the airline did see some value in selling these slots and asked the bankruptcy court to permit it to sell the slots uh, and then of course return the balance of, of uh, the proceeds to the estate for the benefit of the creditors. Initially this was approved by the bankruptcy court, uh, but at that stage uh, there were a number of, of entities who got involved and in, in objecting, including the competition authorities, uh, CADE in Brazil. Um, and so ultimately on appeal, the appellate court reversed this and said, no, the slots need to go back into the pool. That is the sort of common holding area for unallocated slots and be reallocated out to uh, competing airlines, not in a, in a bidding war, but, you know, based on the allocation priorities that exist in the, in the regulation. Uh, it was, it was a really interesting case in that it saw this sort of crossover between airline regulation, bankruptcy, and then competition law. Uh, and ultimately, and, and this is kind of a, a discussion for another another day, perhaps, but the, the decision that the competition regulator took to reallocate the slots was really, in our view, pretty questionable. Uh, they put their thumbs on the scale quite a bit uh, and, and essentially just chose who would be getting the slots, which was not quite the result that we would have liked to see. Uh, but I think in both Monarch and Avianca Brazil, they both of these cases show the tension between obviously the, the estate and its creditors wanting to get whatever money it can out of these slots without caring who gets them on the opposite end. It'll just be uh, ideally for them, whoever wants to pay the most money for them versus the interest of the airports, perhaps of the competition regulators uh, and certainly the other airlines who are competing who would prefer them to be returned to the pool and allocated uh, pursuant to the slot regulations, which aren't based just on who's going to bid the highest amount of money for them. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a real tension that we see in these cases that I think uh, is coming from the fact that this is often one of the only uh, uh, unsecuritized assets of, of the airline. And so it's for you know, a, a bankruptcy practitioner or administrator who's looking to try to get some, something out of the estate that's not already uh, leaned up, that, that may be one of their few options to look towards. All right, thanks, John. Uh, Christian, how, how is the uh, balance struck uh, in the Air Berlin proceedings? Um, yeah, I think it's it's um, it's pretty it's pretty similar to a certain extent, except that it's it's important to understand that Air Berlin kept flying throughout the proceedings. So so that was an insolvent but regularly operating airline, and uh, there was another player in. Um, which was ultimately uh, the federal government who had indirectly secured um, a dip loan. We'll touch on that a bit later. Um, so so uh, that was secured against the estate. So obviously everybody was, was interested in trying to maximize the returns and trying to get a sales price, which was as high as possible. Um, there were a couple of, um, the, or oh, there was a large 
a large opponent player involved in that, which was the merger control uh, entities on the European and on a German level. Because obviously um, the first uh, or the obvious one to talk to was of course Lufthansa operating a lot of, let's say similar slots and, and uh, operations. And that actually turned out to be a problem. So, so a couple of these negotiations um, went difficult. EasyJet at the same time, because they had very valuable slots, especially in Berlin and in Düsseldorf, um, uh, who was trying to look at entering into the German market on a, let's say, uh, uh, not only leisure travel basis. So if you do that, you're of course interested in getting the early slots on a day where you can get the business people traveling and the same late at the end of the day, so you can get them home again. And that was, that was one of the, the most valuable parts of the estate. I don't like to call it an asset. So what, what ultimately happened is that because of the structure that the merger control um, had, uh, had, in, had in mind, they split it up. Um, parts of the slots were again allocated uh, into a, yeah, let me call it subsidiary or group related entity, which then was sold and partially did so-called uh, wet lease concepts of so flying for other airlines. That was one of the ways of using them, but still, st still a couple of them got lost despite of that because of the 80-20 rule. So of course, an airline does not only have valuable slots, they also operate slots, which you think might not be profitable. So ultimately, I think it went into a, let's say, fair balanced mix. Um, um, but uh, you, you could see from the way how Lufthansa behaved that, that obviously they were extremely interested in, in getting hold of these slots because they considered them as well to be a very valuable uh, thing for their market position. Uh, in the German and European market, so. Excellent, thanks Christian. Uh, Luke, uh, what do you see happening in, in the US on this issue? Sure, so in the, in the US it's been an interesting um, sort of flip back over the past 25 years. There were a number of cases going way back to the 80s when the FAA regulations were much more generous where airlines like Bramf and Gull Air and others did successfully monetize their slots and sell them pursuant to 363 sales. Um, we haven't seen that more recently, I think for two reasons. One, the FAA regulations uh, make that somewhat uh, difficult to just sell it to the highest bidder. And second, you know, in the wave of airline restructurings beginning in 2003, going up through American uh, in the you know, uh, past four or five years, none of those airlines uh, did significant um, uh, uh, asset dispositions or uh, um, restructuring of their operations. They mostly kept and retained their slots. Um, the one asterisk on that that was uh, an interesting use of the bankruptcy court's power was um, pursuant to Americans' merger agreement with U.S. Airways, the DOJ did require them from an antitrust perspective to divest a significant number of their slots uh, in New York, uh, Washington, and elsewhere on the East Coast. And the way they effectuated that was through a settlement agreement that was approved under Bankruptcy Rule 9019, where the uh, American agreed to transfer those uh, key slots to Southwest and JetBlue, and the FAA agreed to treat them on the same terms and conditions in terms of allowing them to, uh, to assume those slots. Um, we're also right now in the wave of um, you know, both treasury financings that we're gonna talk about in a while and uh, dip financings in uh, many of the, the Latin American cases that have filed. We're seeing a lot of lender interest in, in pledging uh, slots as collateral, particularly you know, at, at key airports, at, at JFK, at Heathrow um, and the like. Um, and you know, depending on whether those airlines are able to get plenty of exit financing and um, you know, repay those loans in full or not, there could be a number of very interesting issues coming down the pike in terms of uh, trying to monetize that collateral. Excellent, thanks Luke. Uh, on the financing front, we're seeing uh, some novel approaches being taken during COVID-19. Luke, going back to you, can you tell us what's happening with uh, out-of-court financings in the US? Sure. Well, um, you know, fortunately, uh, our government seems to have an unlimited appetite to print money. Um, so the uh, most recent 
and um, you know, really beneficial for the industry program has been uh, the U.S. Treasury's payroll support program. Um, full disclosure, uh, Clary Gottlieb represents the U.S. Treasury both on the payroll support program and on the, the term loans that are, that are to come. Um, the payroll support program, and I'll just put up a little slide here just to give people a, uh, just a sense of the scale of the program, um, which really is quite uh, surprising. Um, sorry, just give me one second. This is the wrong slide deck, excuse me. Here we go. So if we look at the payroll support program, a total of $32 billion was made available under the payroll support program. That's not just for passenger air carriers, but also for cargo air carriers and certain critical um, contractors to those industries. Um, the most important feature of the payroll support program is that um, in exchange for taking these funds, the airlines had to agree that up through September 30th, which is knocking on our door, there could be no furloughs, no layoffs, no reduced schedules, um, and that all of the funds had to go directly for the benefit of paying employee wages, employee benefits, employee salaries. Um, this had, you know, uh, I think there's been a lot of press that from uh, a market perspective, this had a tremendous buoyant effect in terms of keeping, um, you know, keeping money in the supply chain, keeping people in their homes, keeping people able to meet uh, their obligations. Um, you can see in just in terms of dollar amount, you know, American took almost six billion going all the way down to uh, Republic, which took still, you know, over $200 million. The way that Treasury um, compensated themselves for, um, you know, what might be the you did what factor um, is they took warrants. Um, and, you know, we will see in the coming years where the warrant strike price that they negotiated turns out. But it could be um, if these warrant strike prices uh, become attractive and the airline industry really comes back within the, um, the time period of the warrant. Treasury could be made fully whole or even make a, a profit for the taxpayer on these programs. There have been um, political efforts to uh, try to extend the payroll support program. As of right now, those are not going anywhere. So, you know, uh, a lot of airlines have announced extremely significant reductions in force beginning immediately after September 30th. Um, and it may be a, a very sad day for, you know, tens of thousands of employees. All right, thanks, Luke. Uh, Christian, we've heard about uh, Lufthansa, uh, which is obviously a major player in the market, uh, almost going bust due to COVID-19. What's happened in Germany to prevent uh, a filing there? It's pretty, um, um, it's kind of the same mechanics behind it than in the US. So, of course, from a political side, nobody was interested in um, getting Lufthansa, uh, which had one of the best years <laughs> since, they, since they existed in 2019 to get into a filing process in 2020. So um, uh, in, in Germany or in Europe in general, I would call it, there is a certain uh, sympathy for uh, printing money to make the problem go away at the moment. Um, that's of course not a very nice thing to say, but that's, that's ultimately what it is. Um, there are certain funding options available. So again, as in the US, we've got the possibility of getting support for employees' wages. Um, and there is something, especially in Germany, available, which is a state-owned fund, which can take equity, equity shares into certain, let me call it, critical um, companies. And um, one of them was Lufthansa. So it's indirectly now the federal government are owning a stake in Lufthansa, which still is a stock-listed company. Um, uh, the, the idea behind it is, is of course, um, uh, to 
provide them with a bridge finance and then get a, let's say, straight, straightforward or more or less straightforward exit um, out of that. So uh, there is no appetite uh, at the governmental or at the European level to stay in the company for an undefined uh, period of time. However, nobody knows what the industry will do. And um, at, at the moment, the answer to your question, Adam, is uh, they have the government as a shareholder. Um, at the same time, they're of course restructuring. So there are uh, intense discussions going going on on cost reduction. There are discussions going on on um, uh, putting people uh, free, um, terminating contracts, cost cutting, all that stuff. So so that's that's going on in parallel. But the answer ultimately is uh, the state or the governmental fund controlled by the company provided an equity uh, and took a stake in the company. Thanks, Christian. Uh, so, Kat, there are some interesting things going on in the UK at the moment. Can you give us a, an update of what's happening there? Right. So, um, the Bank of England has this general fund, the COVID corporate financing facility. It's a lending scheme. So, these are loans for any COVID uh, affected companies that, that come within the guidelines. Um, as you can imagine, the airlines have been a big uh, taker of, of some of these loans. So I'm just going to run down a couple of the um, big numbers. EasyJet has gotten 600 million, Ryanair 600 million, British Airways 300 million, Wizz Air 300, IAG, which covers BA Aer Lingus, Iberian Vrilling, they've gotten 300 million. Um, but you know who didn't get any relief, and I'm sure this this is not news to anyone on this call, but it was Virgin Airlines. Even though Mr. Branson was willing to lean his private island, the government wasn't interested. Um, so Virgin just completed its voting under the new super scheme under Part 26A, which is the um, scheme of arrangements under the Companies Act used to deal with uh, companies in distress. And as some of you might be aware, the scheme allows for, potentially allows for cross-class cram-down, which the UK had never had before. Um, the scheme in Virgin uh, involved about a 20% reduction of debt over the four classes. There are four classes of creditors, including Virgin's uh, RCF lenders, uh, aircraft lessers, and um, other creditors. The fourth class was uh, trade creditors, and um, before the scheme had been launched, the three classes of creditors, um, the financial creditors, had, had all pretty much signed up uh, and, and agreed to the scheme. The trade creditors were still up in the air, um, but with the vote ha has come in, and 99% of the trade creditors have approved the scheme. So we all thought we were going to see a very interesting cross-class cram-down fight in the UK. We're going to have to wait for another day. So um, watch this space. It'll be very interesting. Thanks, Kat. Uh, John, can you tell us what's happening in other jurisdictions? Yes, I mean, I think in general, we have seen a number of governments stepping up to help uh, the airlines in their country, which obviously we're pleased to see. Uh, although, of course, a lot of this money is ultimately going to have to be repaid. Uh, so I think if you look back at the slides I presented at the beginning of the first uh, session of, of this webinar, uh, this is increasing the leverage of the airlines quite a bit. Uh, and I'm sure they're all very happy to take the help <laughs> if the option is is going under, but it is still you know, somewhat pushing down the problem for another year, uh, another two years, whenever they it may come due. Uh, but we have, you know, some specific examples that are in the press, uh, as well as the ones that have been mentioned, uh, Norwegian, uh, there was a debt to equity swap, plus the Norwegian government uh, gave them a bailout loan. And I think they've been in the press actually, uh, just recently saying they may need further help. Um, South African Airways, so that's a case where they actually are already in a restructuring proceeding. Uh, and the South African government, which has given them uh, some assistance in the past as well in the forms of guarantees and other uh, assistance is also the, the proposed exit financier for that. Uh, the last I saw on that, and it, it may have been updated recently, but the last I saw on that, the government was still uh, sort of considering its position. And in fact, I think maybe even uh, trying to sell some of its interest in the airline. So that one may be a bit TBD. 
but I think that and some of the other cases like it, um, Blue Air, for example, in Romania, perhaps uh, Czech Airlines, which has just filed uh, for a, a, a preventative restructuring process, uh, it, 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 they indicate that you know the, the request for government aid isn't going to cease just because there has been a filing. Uh, and many times uh, the governments may actually even wish the airline to, to file for a preventive restructuring chapter 11 type proceeding first. Uh, so that they have a little bit more certainty as to how the funds will be put in, uh, how the creditors will be treated, et cetera. And I think the other thing I would briefly add on this is we have, uh, we've also seen uh, a lot of quick and helpful approvals uh, from the EC on on state aid in this area as well. Uh, obviously the, the requirements on that have been relaxed quite a bit during COVID uh, given the situation and that has helped uh, governments in the EU uh, be able to put money into the airlines perhaps a little more freely than they could have done before that. Excellent, thanks John. Um, United Airlines obtained financing earlier this year by offering their loyalty program as security. Luke, can you uh, please explain what uh, they did and how they went about it? Sure, and, and this is a really interesting overlay between uh, the tension that airlines have in potentially taking the, the loan program that we mentioned that Treasury is offering and that uh, for many airlines hopefully will be closing this week. Only some of those airlines have uh, disclosed the amounts of, uh, of, their, of their loans. Uh, American in particular disclosed that they have a 4.75 billion uh, secured term sheet. Um, one of the most valuable assets for any airline are these loyalty programs and the co-brand uh, agreements that they have with, uh, with, with banks where, you know, um, it's a very affluent customer base. It's a very loyal customer base and they charge a lot. And that requires, you know, that every month the airline buy um, a significant, uh, sell a significant number of miles to the bank for them to deposit into their uh, customers' loyalty accounts. And it's a very reliable, it's proved to be very reliable even after COVID as a, as a stable cash flow. Um, for a lot of airlines, uh, including airlines that are you know, potentially considering treasury loans, it's very difficult to engineer a vehicle through which you can uh, securitize those assets, the, uh, the intellectual property that makes up the uh, that makes up the loyalty program and the customer list um, because it's been historically either integrated with the operating carrier and at the operating carrier entity, or it's held in a bunch of different uh, baskets, um, all many of which are subject to limitations from their senior secured financing on you know, doing material asset transfers. Uh, United was very, very fortunate in that for uh, several decades, they always had almost all of their um, uh, loyalty program assets, including uh, the trademarks and the customer data in a specific entity. So they were able to come to market with a, a very unique uh, financing where they were gonna contribute all of those assets down to a wholly owned uh, bankruptcy remote Cayman SPV uh, and, uh, and, and issue off of that. And uh, those assets uh, were very, very well received. The pricing was very uh, favorable to the airline, uh, and uh, they ended up raising, you know, in excess of of three billion dollars out of that. And you'll see, I think, with airlines that were able to do that, as well as, you know, we've talked about, or we will talk about, airlines um, that have done straight equity offerings uh, in in. Uh, in a distressed atmosphere, um, the airline's ability to do those kinds of market financings is going to be a direct uh, reduction dollar for dollar in the amount they're going to need to take in the Treasury uh, loan program, which obviously has um, a rescue financing flavor to it and has a lot more restrictive covenants and a lot less of an ability to, to negotiate with Secretary Mnuchin. Thanks, Luke. Uh, let's uh, transition to in-court uh, financings now. And going back to you, Luke, uh, in the current U.S. Uh, Chapter 11 proceedings, are we seeing a robust market for dip financings or are debtors forced uh, to go with their pre-petition lenders or lenders of last resort? We are absolutely seeing an extremely robust uh, dip market in the United States. And um, we are counsel to uh, the debtors in LATAM and to Apollo as the successful 
dip lender in, um, in the Aeromexico proceedings. So let me just pull up a little bit of a, a slide to give you uh, a flavor of what those financings look like um, and just how competitive the terms uh, have been. Sorry, just one second. Ugh, sorry, wrong one. I will get there. So here you can see on a side-by-side -side basis, the, the dips that are on the table in Aeromexico, in LATAM, and in Avianca. So um, in both LATAM and Aeromexico, um, I think it bears note that these are new money financings. These are not um, roll-ups. These are not existing lenders. Um, LATAM got uh, a tranche A from uh, Oak Tree, um, a tranche B, which is uncommitted and is possible government financing, and a tranche C from a number of its existing shareholders for a total of 2.45 billion. Um, you can also see, I think it's very important that the, uh, the LATAM dip has an equity conversion uh, available at the debtor's option, uh, which I think you know, the lender's willingness to accept that really bodes well for people's faith and uh, view that the industry is gonna come back. Similarly, in Aeromexico, there was a very competitive process between uh, a number of dip lenders. Um, they ultimately went with our client uh, Apollo and uh, the total is one billion in two tranches. Uh, Aeromexico is also notable because uh, the need for financing was so acute and the timing was so tight that the initial dip order was approved on the basis of a term sheet. There are no full credit docs and the lenders are largely relying on the bankruptcy court order for perfection. Um, just one unfortunate uh, timing uh, note is that the LATAM dip uh, was the subject of a uh, multiple uh, day evidentiary hearing uh, with the UCC objecting to the shareholders participation in the dip and that it was an insider dip. Um, that uh, decision is sub judice before Judge Garrity. Um, the commitments actually would have expired on Friday because no decision had been entered. They've now been extended by about a week and uh, we're all waiting with bated breath for Judge Garrity to come down with his ruling. Uh, in Aeromexico, Judge Chapman lapped Judge Ger Garrity and uh, entered her interim dip order uh, the same day the hearing was held and um, they're off to the races. So we're seeing a very, very robust market um, and hope, you know, for the benefit of the industry that they continue to be able to leverage off of multiple lenders and get competitive terms, including, you know, equity conversions that are really going to take the pressure off of the exit financing package that they have to get. Great. Thanks, Luke. Uh, Christian, there are loans provided in Germany within the Air Berlin and Condor insolvency proceedings. Uh, how does the concept of in-court financing differ? Uh, in Germany uh, from the dip financing in the United States? Uh, there are a couple of um, uh, things which work quite differently and, and a lot of the investors and fund to, funds are trying to enter or do, do their concepts in the German markets um, will find themselves in some difficulties. Um, one of them is what do you get as a security? Um, it's, it's the free estate, not more, not less. You can't top up existing security um, or stuff like like that. That's not going to be possible. What you get hold of is is the free estate, including whatever can be collected by way of clawback um, and other things. So ultimately, this is not targeting the assets. I think that's that's the first thing. Um, if you provide a dip loan, you will be looking at a repayment rather than targeting the assets or getting hold of a certain asset or piece of the estate. Um, the next one is that it's um, Obviously, 
terms do matter. So what is the interest rate? What are the fees connected to that? How high are they? Um, because liquidity normally in an insolvency proceeding is, is the, key, the key thing to look at. And especially with an airline proceeding, which, which eats up your liquidity straight away. So technically, um, it's, it's, it's for a fund, it, it'll always be a risky game to do it. So they will look at a higher yield, which might create the next problem for the liquidity base. So typically, what, what happens in larger proceedings is that you will see um, uh, one of the state or partially state-owned banks, uh, which, which will provide for a loan, which then going to be backed up by a guarantee. That will normally be because there is a security behind it given by the by the state or by the local government or the federal government that will make terms much more interesting for the airline or the debtor uh, because they, they tend to be lower. They're also not, let's say, uh, fees which debtors tend to look at as being reluctant or incredibly high. So, so that would normally be the first, the first choice. And to face it, because um, you can only you can only get hold as a security of the free estate, which at the point where you need the finance, uh, you might not even know how valuable that is. Um, there are only very limited players who might want to take the risk under these circumstances. So, uh, and, and that's obviously then the answer to your question, what, what happened to Condor um, slash Air Berlin? Well, that was the structure of, of the Diplo and it was ultimately a governmental loan, although not directly. Um, it was a loan provided by a related entity, then being backed up by a guarantee, and that, uh, of course, was uh, quite competitive. Although I, I appreciate that on an international level, uh, the terms look, look just just showed are extremely competitive. But I would say, from a from a German perspective, the terms they they got should be uh, slightly below. Excellent. Thanks, Christian. Uh, Kat, uh, can you do dip financing uh, under this new uh, UK super scheme? No, not in a super scheme. So, um, and, and the UK creditors lobby has been very resistant to priming liens. And for debtors, that's a big deal, the ability to get a dip. Um, so big that it could drive uh, companies with um, you know, large international operations to to consider where they're going to file based solely on wh whether or not they can get a dip. Um, so under the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020, that put tw Part 26A in place, the super scheme, um, dip financing would le was left out. But we can look at a very creative workaround, uh, Swiss port. And, uh, you know, as, as I'm sure we're we should have all made this disclaimer, all of, our, um, all of this is our own views and not the views of our firms. Um, but getting that out of the way, I should note that Swissport has slightly unique circumstances. So they're definitely not the loophole model case, um, but, but they did put in what would some people, the ability to put in a synthetic dip through a scheme. So what did they do? They made changes to their financial documents to allow for a low threshold of the senior secured creditors to prime themselves um, where the documents didn't already provide for super senior debt to be incurred. Um, they're also using existing baskets uh, that were already allowed under the senior debt. Um, they didn't seek consent from junior creditors and that could be challenged and there's not much more to say about that. Um, so if you have these special circumstances, consent of senior, senior secured creditors, existing basket capacity, and creditors who are not going to challenge uh, your ability to put in a super priority loan through a scheme, that could in theory be done. Um, interestingly though, uh, the door is open for a potential dip in a CVA, which is a company voluntary arrangement under the Insolvency Act. Now in a CVA, the directors can apply to go into a moratorium for an initial period of 20 days. This is um, also new um, and implemented by SEGA 2020. Um, during that period, the directors remain in charge, but a licensed insolvency pr practitioner is appointed as a monitor. And he or she is going to monitor the company affairs 
and uh, review whether it remains likely that the moratorium will result in the rescue of the company as a going concern. Now, during the moratorium period, the creditors are at a standstill and they are to refrain from enforcement action. Uh, this is, you know, to provide um, a bit of breathing space to allow the rescue of the business. But during this period, the company can borrow and they can incur credit, provided that they disclose that there is a moratorium and they can grant security over property, provided that the monitor consents. So this, this really opens up the ability for um, debtors to get dip financing um, through a CDA. So I, I think we, we may see some interesting cases come in the UK trying to use this, this process. All right, thanks, Kat. Uh, John, do you have any additional comments on dip financing? Uh, yeah, thanks, Adam. And maybe if I can circle back to how we first started the, the first session on this, um, which is to say that IATA is very strongly in favor of restructuring proceedings to preserve the value of an airline, uh, both to its passengers, to its employees, and to its local economy, uh, especially right now during this unprecedented crisis. And I'm sure that doesn't come to a huge surprise, uh, come as a huge surprise to anyone given that we're the airline trade body. Uh, but generally, I think we've been very pleased to hear, you know, as Luke has said, as, as Christian and Kat have said, that there are possibilities to get dip financing uh, even during this crisis. And in fact, in the US, at least, we see that it's a, a very robust uh, bidding wars going on. And so whether it's, it's the private sector or in some cases the government that is stepping in to help, uh, I, we always, we, we welcome this. And in fact, it's usually one of the first questions that we ask when we hear that an airline is filing is, is do they have a dip? What is the plan to keep going? Uh, because we talked in the first session about the need for the regulations to permit operations in the first place. Uh, you know, for example, before the super scheme, you couldn't really continue operations as an airline in insolvency in the UK. But obviously, if you have no cash, then the regulations are one thing, but you're, you're not flying anywhere without any cash and, and cash is king, especially for airlines. Uh, so, so dip financing is, can be a very important second prong to that analysis. Uh, and, and, you know, we're, we're happy to see again that the airlines have been able to access during this crisis and, and therefore hopefully uh, we'll be able to have successful restructurings and come out the other side uh, leaner and stronger. Great. Thanks, John. I, I think we're uh, ready to move into the question and answer uh, portion of this webinar. And uh, we have one audience question, uh, comment and question that uh, comes from James Cole. Um, and James says, I, I think the Monarch case uh, regarding slots upheld the principle that an air carrier needs to have a valid operating license to hold slash trade slots, but hinged on whether a license which is suspended subject to an appeal procedure is still valid. Uh, how can this ambiguity be addressed? Kat, if you could uh, take that. Right, so I think we'll have to see another case um, because what happened in Monarch was that the, um, the appeal uh, overturned the lower court ruling and it wasn't taken any further. And so the law as it stands is that, the, um, that a license subject to appeal is still valid. So, um, uh, so, you know, unless this is challenged again with different facts and circumstances, I don't, I don't, I don't see, um, I don't see how it changes. Yeah, Adam, if, if I can jump in there as well. Um, be because of the timing of the case, IATA wasn't able to file an amicus brief or anything uh, to get involved, but we did uh, make some statements publicly. So this is not anything, uh, I'm not speaking out of turn here, uh, but we were, pretty disappointed with the way the ruling came down. It, it, it's maybe getting into a little bit of a weed in the weeds, but it was a really uh, technical sort of loophole situation where the, the airline had, as Kat said earlier, they, they had no ability to operate. There were, the pilots were all gone. Uh, I think they tried to argue that, well, we have a few pilots, but they were pilots that were uh, in the, the, the C-suite who used to be pilots. <laughs> they weren't you know, <laughs> currently flying pilots. Uh, and they, they appealed the, the suspension of the license just for the sole purpose of getting the slots reallocated to them. There was no, they had no, um, they had, they had no good faith way of getting the, the 
uh, the challenge approved, but they knew that would push their, their deadline of, of removing the AOC long enough so that they could get the slots reallocated. And from my auto standpoint, we don't think that that's the, the spirit of the regulations. Um, you know, as Kat says, I think we're stuck with it. Um, unless you we could, get another John, case. You could, you could see different facts and circumstances where that, uh, 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 you know, I, I'm not going to make a, uh, I'm not going to say anything about the Monarch case and <laughs> their, um, you know, their good faith, but you could see where there was good faith in um, another case of um, a company that is appealing the suspension of its license. Sure. Yeah. I mean, if, so, if the airline was still it's around, tricky, and there was, it's tricky. Yeah. No, there absolutely are cases where uh, a license has been suspended for, you know, questionable reasons, or the airline really does want to challenge it on on the merits. Uh, that wasn't what was going on with Monarch. But and, and to be fair, I don't blame them. The the administrators were doing their job to try to maximize the value of the estate. I, t I totally get that. Right. Uh, but uh, you know, I think barring another case that rules differently, maybe the only other option is that we we, uh, we advocate for a change in, in the regulation to try to close that loophole. Uh, but honestly, I mean, right now, there's so many other concerns in the industry, I, I doubt we'll be able to make that a priority one. But, uh, but yeah, it definitely remains out there. Thanks both. Uh, Luke, uh but uh, heard about this I interesting scenario with Hertz, uh, and, and this is not airline related, but rather travel industry related uh, uh, with Hertz uh, making an equity offering uh, while in bankruptcy. Can you uh, explain this briefly? Sure. Tried to make an equity offering while in bankruptcy. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really kind of the uh, most extreme version of this trend we've seen where we've seen companies that, you know, people regard as quite distressed still being able to do common equity offerings. Um, Hertz filed uh, for bankruptcy in late May, um, and its stock predictably tum tumbled, and it announced that it was actually in the process of delisting. But then through um, sort of a mysterious set of factors, the stock price climbed all the way back up to $6. And Hertz uh, actually got bankruptcy court approval to do an at-the-market equity offering, which um, you know the disclosures said sort of in big, bold letters, uh, you have no guarantee of getting anything. We are in bankruptcy. Um, and the bankruptcy court actually ultimately approved it, but the SEC subsequently applied so much regulatory pressure and scrutiny that they abandoned the transaction. But it does, um, you know, leave open, I think, a question that uh, many of us had probably written off of whether, um, while in Chapter 11, not in connection with an exit, you can do a, a, a registered common stock offering. Great, thanks, Luke. Um, well, I, I think we've uh, come to the end of our webinar and I wanted to thank everyone for attending today and a special thank you to the panelists for their hard work uh, putting this together, especially over holiday season and, and other life uh, developments. Uh, a recording of uh, this webinar will be available on the III website and will also be available on uh, III's YouTube channel. I'll uh, now turn it over to Ivan Romo who will provide the closing comments today. Thank you, Adam. Okay, uh, as chairperson of the Next Gen program, I want to thank you. This was very interesting as well as the last session. Uh, Kat, John, Christian, Luke, and you, Adam, did a great job. Uh, it was very interesting. So we are looking forward to see you again in another webinar. Thank you so much for all to, to all the participants. Take care. Thanks. Thanks thank you. Bye.